Hi y'all, in this video I'm going to talk about military physical fitness standards for men, for women, and for people of different ages. Uh, and the reason I'm going to do it is because Noah Plum did a video the other day uh, talking about the Royal Air Force and how it's achieved gender equality for women but not for men because of the physical uh, fitness standards that have to be met for men and for women and how they're different. And that bespeaks uh, discrimination in his mind. But before I get to that, I'm going to preface it with um, a, a likeness to another kind of argument that I have and how this argument, this conversation, is exactly like this other argument. If you've ever discussed the wage gap with a feminist, that's what this conversation is like for people who are persuaded that men are being discriminated against because of the physical fitness standards. No matter how you explain that, that on average, women make different uh, career choices than men make, uh, that they will pr prioritize family time and comfort over having you know hard manual labor jobs out in the elements or exceedingly long work weeks, and that is what explains the disparity in pay, you know, they're going to, la, 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 not going to have any of it. For a lot of people, th uh, this conversation is the uh, male equivalent of the wage gap conversation. There isn't any discrimination going on, and I'm going to explain why. So, no Plum, some while back I watched a video of yours in which you gave a really great example. I don't remember what the video was about, but the example you used that you made up was just so good, it really stuck in my mind, and it was about underwater elephants. And it was, it was really clever, it was really whimsical, it was very fanciful, and so it stuck out in my mind. And in that vein, I'm going to give you a very fanciful uh, analogy before we get into the actual uh, meat of your video. Suppose that there were an island of humans uh, somewhere that we haven't discovered yet, and they all speak English because that is convenient uh, here because they're going to be transported to America. And they uh, are no more advanced than uh, our ancestors in the 17th and 18th centuries. You know, so they still believe in witchcraft. They don't know anything about modern medicine. And somehow or other, we collect a couple of them, or one of them, and bring him over to the United States. And he wanders into a hospital and is just knocked over by the brutality that is going on there because he knows nothing about uh, the human heart, its electrical system. He knows nothing about electricity, diagnostic equipment. But what he sees and he's a human rights activist, so he's going to get really exercised about this and go around demanding that people uh, come before him and explain how we can tolerate this kind of brutality going on in our societies. He's going to go on big speaking tours about the great horrible evil, the brutality that is happening in America's uh, hospitals. So what he sees is that uh, a lot of cardiac patients come in, and uh, after he observes this and he observes uh, some care going on in a cardiac step-down unit or a cardiac care unit, he goes back to his people and he explains what he saw, and he's very exercised, very energized, and outraged about this kind of behavior. And so he explains it this way, because he believes that the reason that the EKG is hooked up, the purpose that is uh, being tested for there, is a person's ability to use their aura to make a certain kind of lines appear on this little paper that is printed out and on the screen. And people who don't produce that line, sometimes they get a free pass. But other times, a whole bunch of people come around, they hold the person down, and they start sticking metal tubes in the person's arm and tubes down the throat, and sometimes uh, they take out a knife and they cut the person's chest open, and then they break the ribs, and they put this device in there that cranks the ribs open, and they start with these weird-looking objects, they stick them inside the chest and start torturing the person, and torturing them, and torturing, and torturing them until he dies. Occasionally, a person who goes in and is unable to produce the right kind of pattern, has the bad rhythm, uh, is tortured, and he realizes the error of his ways and forces his aura to make the right pattern. And they go, oh, good job. Uh, we will now let you go into wherever it is you go next, and you'll be treated well. But those who don't comply, those who stand their ground, are killed. And he is outraged by this. The reason he's outraged is not because anything improper is going on. It's because he doesn't know what he's talking about, and he's also uh, quite a bit foolish because what he didn't do is ask someone there what is going on. Instead, he made a whole bunch of assumptions and then decided to go on <clears throat> a big uh, tirade about the great evil that has befallen these poor people who come in there and can't produce the right kind of pattern on the paper. And that's the position we're in here with uh, Noel Plum's video. So Noel Plum thinks there are two uh, rebuttals or explanations that are possible uh, that uh, people might bring up in response to his well-crafted argument. One is that it is, these are only recruits and the standards change later on, or something like that, and the other is that uh, it's, it's gender fair but not gender neutral. My argument is neither of those. 
it's that uh, you don't understand what's being tested for, and therefore you're drawing erroneous conclusions. You're attributing, uh, you you are you are precipitously seeing discrimination where none is afoot. And uh, suppose back in the medical uh, setting, because I know you're a firefighter and you have some training, that uh, a person is really exercised about the the cruelty that we inflict upon children when they go to the hospital, because an adult. When an adult man or an adult woman goes to see the hospital and their vital signs are checked, they will let that person get away with only like 12 to 18 breaths per minute. But if you're a baby, you better be breathing 30 or 40 times a minute, otherwise you don't pass that station. You are a no-go and uh, there is something wrong with you. Now why is this the case? The reason that these, you know, the 12 to 18 or 30, whatever it is, uh, the reason that these numbers are chosen they are, is, is not because it was done a priori, just something picked out of a hat. It's because medical scientists looked around and noticed that people in good health have a particular re and at rest uh, respire at about 12 to 18 breaths per minute. Uh, except for children, they breathe much faster. And we could also do this with tidal volume. Uh, oh, the men have to work so much harder per breath. They're, they're expected to produce uh, one particular tidal volume, and women can get away with doing less. Um, but of course, women could also say that that men get away with being heavier. And why shouldn't women be able to? Why shouldn't a five foot four woman be able to get away with having the same weight on her as a six foot uh, two tall guy? Uh, clearly, there's some fat shaming going on there. And also, uh, my God, we don't make women bend over when they turn forty and shove a finger up their ass to check their prostate. Look how easy they're getting off. Bad turn of phrase there, I apologize for it. The reason for this is that there are physiological differences between men and women. If, uh, if you believe, as Noel Plum believes, that the purpose of the physical fitness test is a combat measure, you're going to go wrong right from the start. Uh, the, the clue is in the title of the test. It is a physical fitness test, not a combat readiness test. What is being uh, graded there is not... Uh, a proxy for what a person is going to be like on a battlefield doing their job in a combat zone. There are two ways that you can go about having physical fitness uh, measured. You can do it based against uh, combat directly, which is one set of tests, or you can do it on a level of fitness. The militaries of the world, at least in the West, work off of looking at a general level of health, not combat readiness tests. Not th There are other things to do for that. So what is expected is if you are a man in good physical health who is regularly uh, training, uh, regularly exercising, uh, you know, strength training, regularly uh, working out his cardiovascular system, you should be able to do A, B, C tasks in X, Y, Z time. Why should you be able to do it? They didn't pluck the numbers out of a hat. They looked at what is it that athletes on average are actually able to do, people who have a moderate level of athletic ability they uh, routinely can perform these types of activities in this amount of time to this standard. So if you do that, then we say, oh, you're in good health. And if it's a woman, uh, female athletes, on average, should be able to do this because when you look at the averages, these are the types of things they're able to do. And so if you are able to do it, we then say not a priori you're okay, but a posteriori, using this as a proxy for a, a, ga a, a gauge of your general level of athletic ability and your general level of physical health in conjunction with uh, you know, routine physicals. So why do we do this? <clears throat> um, in the United States Army, since World War II, they've been looking at uh, this balance back and forth, and every time they come up with a combat readiness test, they get rid of it and go back to the level of physical fitness uh, as opposed to combat readiness, and the reason for it is cost. Uh, a while back I made a video on the transgender ban and the cost associated with it, and people are like, oh, it's only going to be $8 million, and people don't really try to strive to save $8 million out of a budget that large. Nonsense. Um, there is a test coming down, in the, coming down the pike right now that's going to possibly be implemented in our army in the next year or so, and it is going to be a measure of combat performance. But there are going to be costs that come along with it. One of them is a 250-meter sprint back and forth with 60 pounds of weight. They're going to be the kettlebells, or kettle, whatever they're called and it's 30 pounds each. To equip the United States Army with a sufficient number of those is going to be uh, five or six million dollars just to have little weights for this particular test. The test we have now costs almost nothing. You have to have one scale per unit and a tape measure 
and a flat surface on which people can run two miles, whether it be in a circle, a straight line, and back, whatever it is. And then you have know, five or six sticks, five or six lanes where uh, you have graders who are grading the push ups or press ups, as, as you call them in England, and sit ups. And it only takes like two or three hours to do. <coughs> so it is efficient, it's cost effective. And it is a reasonably good proxy for a general level of physical health. And the assumption there being that if you're athletically inclined and in a general state of good health, you are where you need to be for whatever it is we need to train you for later on. There are other costs that come with combat readiness tests. Some of, and some of those, many of, much of it's going to be medical. The harder you make the test, to, which you'll have to do to approximate battlefield conditions, the likelier you are, the likelier you are to sprain and break ankles blow out knees, break people's backs, get head injuries, break arms when people fall off bars, uh, and whatnot. So you're going to have a lot of medical costs that come along with it. You know, tens upon tens upon tens of millions of dollars uh, you know, is going to accumulate from these added medical costs. And so that's why it's taken, you know, at least since World War II for the Army to really get what they think is actually going to work. Now, <clears throat> Uh, Noah Plum seems to be under the impression, because he's mapping onto the military uh, what he knows from civilian life in the fire service, that uh, the like the two and a half kilometer run, the two mile runs, what we do here, whatever you do, in, whatever the distance is in England, that uh, if you can put your pack on and run those 2.5 kilometers in uh, 13 minutes, if you're a woman, you're good. But if you do it in 11 minutes and uh, if you do it in 12 minutes and you're a man, you still fail. And he uses an example of. If you have like a twins, a male and a female, and they both uh, run the same course, and, and the woman gets there two minutes later than the guy, uh, she passes, but he still fails, and that's discrimination. No. It's saying that if you are athletically inclined, this is what you should be able to do. And if you fail to do that, then you're, you're either in poor health or your unit's training standards are inadequate. So your commander knows that uh, if it's just you who's failed, that you aren't doing the exercise, the exercise program that you're on is not good enough to keep you in an athletic condition. And if a lot of other people fail, then he knows that the unit, unit wide has this problem. So uh, you have one thing that's being tested for, but because there are physiological differences uh, between men and women, it has different raw metrics. <clears throat> now, if you think about something like the United States Army's Air Assault School, if you want to go to Air Assault School, uh, you have to have a, uh, by the way, for our minimum uh, standard in the in the U.S. Army, you have to have a score of 180, 60 in, in each of uh, 60 points in, in all three events. To get into air assault school, you have to have a minimum score of 240 with 80 in each of the three events. Why is this? And here's and here's how you know that what's being tested for is actually somewhat effective and not discriminatory. Uh, and it, it's for this reason: they've looked at the scores of people who have gone in whether they be male or whether they be female, if their score is above 240, 240 or above, and they get, an 80, per, they get uh, 80 points in each of the three events, they, will, uh, they have a very high chance of passing um, the, the, the entire course. If they come in lower than that, they have a very good chance of failing the course. And the ones who are lower than that, because they have a really good chance of failing, they try not to, get, uh, to let, uh, try out for this particular course. <clears throat> and it works like this. If you have a guy who makes a 240 on the women's scale, uh, he won't be making a 240 on the male scale. But here's the rub. He'll be making like a 190, 200 on, on the male scale, something like that. I don't remember the exact, exact figures. He will still uh, very likely fail the course, even though he has done a 240 on the female standard. A woman who, who uh, a female who does the 240 has a very good chance of passing the course. So this proxy that's being used for a general level of athletic ability and a general level of physical health serves its purpose without introducing all these additional costs, not only just supplies that need to be purchased, but an extra medical care and a reduction in your, your labor force because, you know, they're having surgeries to get uh, knees replaced or fixed or whatever it is. Um, so it really does work. And when you get to um, any, any of the line units where you have to train on this combat kind of stuff regularly, <clears throat> they do that kind of training. And they do it in, uh, you have like a cycles, green, amber, and red. And each one you do a different part of, a different piece of, of the progression. But um, when you get into green cycle, that's where you're really doing the war fighting kind of stuff. And you're moving, doing maneuvers. <clears throat> and if you think about like a brigade, and uh, sending off a brigade to train, 
that right, like to NTC, that can cost easily $25 million for a, a two-week two training cycle. It is very important that militaries, even in England, uh, save money where they can. And one of the ways that you do it is by having these tests that aren't particularly invasive, that aren't going to impose a lot of undue medical costs that you can avoid and still have a reasonably good proxy and not a lot of specialized equipment to do it. But where you need the specialized equipment, like the obstacle course when you go to air assault school, it's going to be there. And when you get there, or like just like in a line unit, there is one standard for the combat abilities. Uh, it, it is the minimum standard that everyone has to meet, and those people who fail to meet it are sent packing. You're not good enough. Go away, lady. You're not good enough. Go away, sir. And air assault school is a, a good example of this because you have the zero day obstacle course. Uh, zero day, you do a two mile run or two and a half mile run. No, two mile run in camis with sneakers, and you have to do that in 19 minutes, not not the uh, 15, the minimum 15 minutes that men have to do it in. Uh, they have they have 18 or 19 minutes to complete this two miles, and then you go do later on you you do a little PT, and then you go do the obstacle course. And there is one obstacle course. The obstacle is the obstacle and you either get over it or you don't get over it, whether you're a boy or whether you're a girl. If you get over it, you continue going on. If you don't get over it, you go home. There are uh, nine events, seven of which are uh, non-mandatory, so you can fail one of those, but if you fail two, you go away. And then you have two mandatory events, which if you fail either of those, you have, you have to go home. And so when it's climbing up the rope, you know, whether you're a boy or a girl, climb that rope or go home. Women who score over a 240 on their scale do reasonably well at climbing the rope. Men who would score 240 on the female scale, but not 240 on the male scale, don't do well on it. So it, it, it's a reasonably good proxy. It's not perfect, obviously, uh, but it, for, for the cost that goes into it, it's reasonably good at what it does. <clears throat> um, everyone who knows anything about combat-related tasks knows that the physical fitness test is not a good proxy for those tasks, uh, for those combat-related tasks. It's uh, just level of fitness, and then you, you train on those whenever uh, a deployment's coming up, so you're not exposing, your, you're not uh, increasing the attack surface of uh, these events against your soldiers. So that's going on, and it's been a problem that bedevils your military and ours. How do you strike that particular balance? But the new one is going to be a, good, a better proxy for actual combat-related tasks because, as I think I said earlier, in, if I, and if I didn't, I'll say it now. In a, in a war zone, in a combat zone, uh, no plum, despite your, you put on your, your pack and you go run uh, to wherever you get your casualty and do your treatment. Precisely zero people throw on their 60 to 80 pound uh, you know, bag of kit and go run two miles. Does not happen. Once you introduce uh, load bearing to these people, you're walking, you're marching. Uh, the end of the air assault course has a very hard uh, ruck march. You have, you're in full battle rattle, you've got your rubber ducky. For those of you who don't know, rubber ducky is a plastic uh, rifle, plastic M16, but it actually weighs more than the real M16, so there you go. So you're in a full combat load, you've got all your tactical gear on, and you've got to do this 12 miles in three hours or less, whether you're a boy or whether you're a girl. Them's the brakes. So that is what w that's why that test is there, as opposed to saying, "Well, you ran your two miles, uh, that's good enough." It's because you need to know that this person can get from point A to point B in the time frame under a load. And when you want to, t to test that, there is only one effective way to do it. You have to put that person under a load, and you have to go send them out there. But you don't go send them out there under that load for that long of a time without first. Uh, uh, looking at their general level of physical fitness. That's why, you know, whenever you go on a new uh, exercise program, they always say consult your physician, because if you're not in good physical health and you're not athletically trained, you can very easily injure yourself. So anyway, um, no one throws on their pack and goes for a two-mile jog in a war zone. So the new test is going to try to mimic better what's going on. So this is 250-meter sprint thing, where uh, you run, I think it's 25 meters with you know, 60 pounds, and then you have to run sprint back. Uh, with it, and then you have to do uh, you know, full on 25, 25, and then uh, anyway, I don't. I, well, I guess I'll see what it looks like when it goes live. But it's something like that. The time in a combat zone is not measured as a marathon. It's measured as very short sprints. It's not measured as a 15 minute jog. It happens in three to five second intervals. It's very important that you understand this, Noel Plum. The the whole of the battle 
uh, works on three to five second blocks of time. And the reason for that is very simple. When you are in a place where bullets are flying, if you're up for longer than three to five seconds, you are what's known as target practice. So that's why there's the three, uh, the three to five second rushing for uh, maneuvering in, in a combat zone when fire is going on, which is where the combat medics are going to be running to when, they're, when they are called out. They're going to be going out to casualties, not from two miles away in a base camp and, oh, I've got my 80 pounds, I'm going to jog for a couple miles and then get in the middle of the battle. No. They're going to have their shit, the war's going to be going on, and when someone falls, they're going to be bounding in three to five second rushes to get there. Which is why, which is what you want to be training for. It's maximum effort for those three to five seconds. Up, run, down. And by the way, for those of you who might be uh, thinking about joining the army, the correct uh, answer to the question, how long is a three to five second rush, is three to five seconds, Sergeant. Just trust me, that's the answer. Believe me, you'll learn when you get in. Scout's honor, promise. Uh, so it, it is unfortunate that you've tried to map on the physical standards that are uh, used in a fire service to something that happens in a combat zone. Not the same. I realize that police services, fire services, uh, emergency medical services have a lot of paramilitary aspects to them. Uh, but they are only paramilitary aspects. They are not like the actual military. Uh, the military is unique in and of itself. There is no other organization outside of a military that is like a military. And so I'll end with this. Whenever you look around and you see a difference between what's happening to Group A and Group B, the first thing you should not suppose is that there's discrimination happening. You sh the first thing you should suppose is that there are rational actors and there might be a reason for this. And if you can't readily identify the reason, that doesn't lead to the conclusion, therefore someone's invidiously discriminating against someone else. What you should do is find someone who knows about that subject, like, Noel, you could have called me you know, on email, call me on email, type me, text me, uh, and you could have asked me and I've explained it to you. But for those, the rest of you, when you run into that and you come up with some hypothesis about what the explanation is and it leads to the conclusion, therefore someone is being invidiously discriminated against, you're almost certainly wrong. So you need to find someone who knows about that subject and ask that person to explain to you why this disparity. It will avoid the, uh, having to have conversations like this on this issue. And by the way, for feminists out there, it would entirely resolve the, the discussion over the so-called wage gap, by which feminists mean the wage gap that is caused exclusively by invidious discrimination against women because men hate women because patriarchy, misogyny, blah, 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 blah. Don't adopt the same mentality of the nutty feminists uh, when you're looking around the world, Noel Plum. It's not going to serve you well. Have a great day, everybody else. And you too.